morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship at St. John's Lutheran Church. We join our voices together with the order of service as printed in the service folder. I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy Amen. your presence and offer true and faithful service. Grant that our worship on earth may always be pleasing to you, and in the life to come, give us the fulfillment of what you have promised through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The lessons for this 13th Sunday after Pentecost are printed in the service folder. You may read along if you would like. As the Lord looked ahead to the future, he promised that through his prophet, he promised that he would graciously gather those who had been excluded by unbelief. He had gathered them to be his people by faith. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 56. This is what the Lord says. Maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to serve him, to love the name of the Lord and to worship him. All who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declared, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. This is the word of the Lord. We join together in the Psalm of the day, Psalm 133 and 34, and read responsibly as printed. How good and pleasant it is for there the Lord bestows his blessing. 
Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary. And praise the Lord. May the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, bless you from The message of salvation, though, was never intended for the Jews alone, with whom God preserved the promise. God has always desired to show mercy to all, both Jew and Gentile alike. A reading from the letter of Romans, chapter 11. I am talking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient <clears throat> in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound all men over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Alleluia. Alleluia. God's promises of his willingness and power to show mercy to all cause a woman not to waver in her trust in Jesus, but to persistently plead for his help to heal her daughter. I invite you to stand for the reading of his gospel. The gospel according to Matthew, chapter 14. Lord, Lord. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, o Christ. We join together in confessing our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed as printed on the insert. We confess together. We believe.
grace, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You have great faith. That would be quite the compliment to hear about yourself, wouldn't it? Especially if Jesus was the one speaking it. I mean, when Jesus gives out such recognition, such praise, we sit up and take notice. But through all the Gospels, Matthew through John, Jesus spoke such a compliment only twice, one of which we hear in the text for our meditation this morning. So what makes this woman's faith so great? Why was Jesus impressed? If we only had read that final verse, the one where Jesus says, you have great faith, what kind of person do you imagine he'd be talking to? Would it be someone who always wore a smile, even when the going was getting tough? Someone who was brimming or overflowing with confidence? Who wasn't distracted by temptations or disturbed by doubts? It would have to be someone like that, wouldn't you think, for Jesus to make such a compliment about that person? Of course, <laughs> that's not the reality. When we look at this woman whom Jesus complimented, we see someone who is hanging on by a thread, someone who is desperate, also someone who didn't fit the mold as far as the disciples were concerned, someone you wouldn't typically consider a person Jesus would associate with being Jewish. I mean, her, his disciples were getting annoyed with her. And yet this woman, not the disciples, heard Jesus say, you have great faith. How do we get that kind of faith? This morning the Lord leads you and me to see we can have great faith from God. But this woman realized right from the start that she had no right to request anything from Jesus. Do you remember how she expressed that when she first approached Jesus? Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. She didn't come to Jesus claiming that she had some special request that she was entitled to. She didn't claim that she deserved anything from Jesus. In fact, when people say something like, have mercy on me, they're usually asking that they get what they do not truly deserve. This woman knew that she didn't deserve anything from Jesus. And yet she kept pleading after him because of his mercy. And how did Jesus respond? Jesus did not answer a word. <laughs> he stonewalled her. But then shortly thereafter, Jesus did make a comment to his disciples, by the way, that, well, she wasn't going to get his attention. He said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And that was after his disciples started pleading with him to grant her request and just get rid of her. What would she do now? The way she acted showed that she knew Jesus was telling the truth. When God had promised Abraham that one of his descendants would be the promised one, the savior of the world. From that time on, God had paid special attention to the nation of Israel, the Jewish people. But she was Canaanite. And the Canaanites, as you know from your Bible history, they were the enemies of Israel, historically, spiritually. So how could she request anything from Jesus, especially anything good, that he would help her out, help her daughter? Maybe she would turn away if she didn't want to admit that. She would turn away disgruntled at this poor customer service. Or maybe she would turn away because she was heartbroken by Jesus' apparent heartless treatment of her. She didn't, though. What did she do? Instead of trailing behind Jesus and his disciples who kept walking away from her, she ran up in front of them. And then she knelt down on her knees to stop them in their tracks, and she begged, Lord, help me. Now Jesus gave in, right? Wrong. 
it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dog. In other words, Jesus was saying, it wouldn't be right for me to take a good gift God intends for his children, Israel, and throw it away to foreigners, outsiders, little Gentile lapdogs. <laughs> oh, how is she going to react to that? What would she do next? Would she now finally turn away, taking the last shreds of self-respect she had? No. She still stayed and accepted what Jesus said, every word of it, as truth. She knew, she was saying about herself then, by staying there, that she was nothing more than even a little dog in the kingdom of God. Yes, Lord, she said. She was still admitting she had no inherent right to claim anything, let alone anything good, from God, and that Jesus had a priority while he was in this world toward God's covenant people, the Jews. By the way, do you notice how our service this morning, again today, echoes and reflects this woman's pleas, her cries to Jesus? Christian churches have been doing this for centuries by saying, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Again this morning, you and I, like that Canaanite woman, come before the Lord with a request, but only one that's based on him, who he is. Lord, forgive us. Have mercy on us. You and I know, we claim about ourselves that we have no right on our own to say anything to God. Instead, we recognize, as we also said this morning at the beginning of the service, that what we truly deserve, punishment both now and eternity, like the Canaanite woman, we're asking God to not give us what we deserve. Lord, have mercy. What more appropriate prayer for us as we begin worship, as we begin any day, for people with simple hearts and unclean hands. And what greater assurance from God for us that he shows mercy, that he shows love and forgiveness without favoritism or limit. It, what makes this woman's faith great or any of ours great? It's that she came before God empty-handed. That she made no claims on Jesus that he had to listen to her. She relied solely on his tender mercy. But then she kept following Jesus. She kept after him. So something else was also driving her. Something else was always leading her to Jesus to not let go of him. I mean, she could have understood that everything she saw and heard at those moments, from Jesus especially, told her, would convince her, that the Lord didn't care. Again, you have to imagine how this scene is playing out. Jesus and the disciples are walking away from her. His back is toward her most of the time. And, of course, the disciples' contemptuous glares and their disgusted whispers about her. And yet she kept going, driven by something unseen. Do you remember what this woman, what she said about Jesus, how she addressed him? Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. That name, that title, son of David, that tells us she knew something about who Jesus truly was. Son of David, at the very least, she knew that Jesus was a descendant of the renowned king, David. But son of David, that had special meaning to it, messianic tones to it. So she likely knew also that as God had promised David a special descendant, Jesus was this savior king who would live and reign forevermore, who would live and reign as Lord and savior to be with, to be, to bless his people, to bring them good. 
And then what she says in response to Jesus' reference to her as a pet dog, we also learn what's going on in her heart and mind. Yes, Lord, she said. And even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. So she knew that although she wasn't a Jew by birth, that although she wasn't numbered among God's chosen nation then, the covenant people, God still had something for her. If not more, it certainly wouldn't be any less than soul-saving crumbs. Anything from God can only be good and gracious. She knew that when God had promised Abraham that one of his descendants would be the savior of all, he had also said then, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples, even Canaanites, even Rahab back when, in Joshua's day, one of the first examples, they could receive blessing, grace, from the offspring of Abraham, from the later son of David. It's what God had promised. And God never, never goes back on his promises. He kept reiterating, repeating his promises over the centuries. So this woman, that's what she clung to with all her heart and life. It was that promise that drove this woman to cry out again and again to Jesus. The promise, have mercy, because she knew God had made a commitment. God had promised his love, his forgiveness, a place among his people to anyone who put their trust in him, anyone who put their faith in him as savior, regardless of their racial background or their place in society. And what is more, he had promised. And again, the Lord never goes back on his word. She knew whatever she saw, everything that could try to convince her, the Lord didn't care, didn't matter. Her heart zeroed in on those promises that God always keeps. And that's what makes faith great. It's not our willpower. It's not our resolve or our strength. It's the promises of the Lord. It's God's love that moved him to make such good and gracious promises to the world, to you and me, in the first place. I mean, when it comes down to it, it's God's willpower and his strength that he does what he says. He means what he says. Every single thing, every one of his promises to you and me. And what's most important of all is his promise of salvation. That you and I trust that he's taken away our sin and guilt. That you and I are declared, he regards us at this moment forevermore as his holy redeemed people. That's what this woman would not let go of. It didn't matter who she was, what she was asking for, what was happening in her life. If Jesus cared, and he does, that's all she needed to know. That's all she wanted. And that's exactly what she received, that assurance. Have mercy on me. So we have the answer then to what makes faith great. Mercy. That God promises us. And he keeps them, keeps them all. And that also answers for us, how will our faith deepen and grow? How can we love God more dearly and follow him more nearly? It's by listening to his word. It's by trusting in and living by everything that the Lord has told us in the Bible. And again, the greatest news of all, that in his son Jesus, the son of David, the son of Mary, we not only have faith, the reason why we came to worship again this morning, why we want to hear, we, we thirst after God's grace and his words. But all the reason we need 
to live and to live forevermore, no matter what happens in this world or to us in this world. It's the assurance by the blood of Jesus that you and I receive in his body and blood again in the sacrament this morning that Jesus always keeps his promises of love and forgiveness, of eternal life, that he'll never go back on his word even when it cost him his life. But that's our selfless, that's the, our Lord's selfless sacrificial love for you and me. Maybe to help us appreciate this a little bit more, I'd like to give you a pop quiz this morning, if you don't mind. Do you remember the gospel lesson from Matthew last Sunday? It offers a nice parallel for this Sunday, but then it contrasts. What is faith, really? So do you remember how Peter, during that storm on the Sea of Galilee, they saw Jesus, Peter and the disciples, but they thought it was a ghost at first. Jesus told them, don't be afraid, it is I, take courage. So then Peter piped up, like he usually does. Lord, if it's you, you tell me to come out to you on the water. He politely commanded the Lord. <laughs> And Jesus said, come. And Peter walked out and was walking on the, on the water toward Jesus. And everything was going A-OK. -okay. Until Peter started to notice the waves. And he felt the wind again around him. Then he began to sink. And how did Jesus talk to Peter afterwards? How did he address Peter? Once he caught him, rescued Peter, and they were both safely back in the boat. You of little faith. And that was one of Jesus' closest disciples. <laughs> you know, at least a year and a half or so in to their discipleship. But here's this woman, a Canaanite at, to boot, desperate. And Jesus says she has great faith. What's the difference then? On that night on the Sea of Galilee, when Peter was walking toward Jesus, everything was okay. Why? Because he kept his focus on his Lord and Savior. And he trusted. He put all his faith in Jesus' invitation, in what he had just said. Come. Jesus meant it. Just one word. But that's all that Peter needed. His word. But then, when Peter, he lost focus of Jesus... He started focusing on the angry waves and wind. He began to sink. This woman, even after Jesus seemed to rebuff her, would pay her no attention at first, she never lost sight of him. She would not let go of the promises she had heard. Somehow, we're not told in Scripture, but she heard that good news about God's Son. And she kept right on after that, it didn't matter if she had to be on her knees begging. The Lord heard her. The Lord would answer her. That was just faith. That is faith. Being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see or in spite of what we're seeing. You have great faith. May you and I constantly fill and refill our hearts and minds like this Canaanite woman with the word of our Lord. Because of what we heard earlier, the word of God is living and active. As we hear, as we meditate on God's word, you and I can't help but have great faith from God. Amen. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. You may remain seated as we continue with Create in Me, that song, as we read that together. Create in me.
We now continue with prayer as printed in the service folder. And among our petitions this morning, we include our brother in Christ, Pat Lamp, and his family, whose father recently entered the joy of heaven. I invite you to stand. Lord of power and grace, whose eyes are on the righteous and whose ears are open to their cries for the mercies that you pour down on us anew each day. We thank you for the gifts of your mighty providence. Make us mindful, O oh Lord, that you have provided us with life, breath, and being, and are the source of our daily breath. We praise you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the Savior of the world. Grant that we may believe in him with all our hearts, learning from him the great truths of the kingdom to which he bore faithful witness. Grant us then your Holy Spirit, that we may produce the fruits of righteousness. May he endow us with unwavering faith, that we might always be ready to do your will. Hear our prayer, o Lord. We also pray for the nations of the earth, subdue terror and tyranny everywhere, and call forth leaders who acknowledge that you are Lord over all the earth. Bless our own land in your mercy. May it ever follow that which is good and turn from all that which is wicked, that our citizens may prosper in uprightness and integrity. Almighty Lord, source of all mercy and giver of all comfort, deal graciously, we pray, with those who mourn the death of a loved one. Especially keep close the family and friends of your, of your redeemed child, Gilbert, whom you called home to heaven. Give them the strength to accept your will and the trust to cast all their sorrow on you, because your love is everlasting. And may the hope your own son's resurrection ensures lift their eyes heavenward to that joyful reunion and that glorious life we and all believers will enjoy in your holy presence with no end. To that end, guide and uphold us during our pilgrimage in this world and bring us all to your heavenly home. Receive these petitions, O Lord, in the name of the Prince of Life, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Our Father. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times <clears throat> and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock till he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Holy, Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. O oh, Christ.
You may be seated. At this time, the ushers will distribute the elements of the sacrament. Once those are distributed, we'll continue with the words of reception. <laughs>
We now continue with the Song of Thanks as we read together the Song of Simeon as printed in the service folder. I invite you to stand. We say, Lord, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Again, welcome to all of you and especially welcome to our guests this morning. It is a privilege to worship the Lord with you and to be strengthened by his mercy and love the promises of his forgiveness and salvation. May God go with you uh, today and the rest of your week. Uh, just a couple announcements I want to highlight. Uh, today is our last day to hand in uh, any of the surveys. There are still printed copies on the little table toward the doors. Uh, please, if you haven't done so by email or handed in a hard copy yet, uh, we'd like your input as the church council so that we can uh, make a best informed decision of how to move ahead with singing, uh, incorporating singing with the hymns and liturgical responses or not. Uh, we want your input for that as fellow members. Otherwise, uh, then about maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, I'll have Bible study here, 19 minute, 20 minute, maybe it's 30 minutes, I never keep track, sorry. Uh, we'll have Bible study here in the sanctuary uh, to which you're invited, of course. Thank you and blessings to your day and week ahead. <laughs> 